three, two, one. Okay, and we're live. So this is actually the second stream. Sorry about any technical issues earlier. But uh, welcome once again to HeroQuest fans. We are doing a, another stream here. And the previous uh, video, I talked about the Japanese HeroQuest. I've been talking about it before, of course. I did the complete read-through of a translation, an English translation of the rules here, done by His Bazargon, based on the work of others from Ye Old Inn. And before that, Old Scratch Inn um, from the fan community. But I also went through the quest book. Now, I didn't spoil everything because this is full of spoilers of all the quests. But basically what you get in the Japanese version is 14 new quests, new official quests, which can either be played with the unique Japanese rules or you could adapt them fairly easily to the European or uh, North American rules. So that's pretty cool, pretty cool thing. So I went through that and there's quite a few things that I didn't cover such as the cards. And I did talk about the character boards, which are different. I didn't talk about the character sheets. Um, so there's a few other things for future discussions. But what I wanted to cover this time, so there's going to be two things. I'm going to talk about the 1989 rule book, or rules of play, rather. This is obviously a printout. Um, so this is from 1989, so credit to Milton Bradley and Games Workshop. This is just a journalistic review of this for fair use. I was going to do that, and then at the end, as a bonus, I'm going to go through some stuff that I've painted. Some furniture, uh, some custom tiles, and other things that I've done. So I've got this whole big box of, of stuff I was going to go through. So anyway, to start out, let's do the reading here. If my voice holds out, of course. So Hero Quest, Rules of Play. So this would, be, would have been the first version that UK players would have seen. And actually, to this very day, this is this is the version that a lot of people had. So when they're getting the 2021 remake, they're thinking, gee, it's it's different than I remember. Yeah, this has uh, changed. Well, that's because this was the original. And of course, it would have been in color and everything. So I'm going to go ahead and read off. Uh, this, this, will, this part will be really familiar to most everyone. Heed well the words of Mentor, Guardian guardian of lore tome and i will tell you of times past of darker days when the empire was saved against all hope for i fear the darkness is about to return the fell legions of morkar lord of chaos had swept all before them at the sight of the black banner and the massed hordes of chaos even the bravest warriors of the emperor had turned tail and fled the land was laid waste and all men despaired but then there came a mighty warrior prince from the borderlands, Rogar the Barbarian, they called him. He bore a glittering diamond on his brow, the Star of the West, as worn by the ancient kings of legend. Hope returned, and men flocked to his standard, leaving their hiding places in the hills and forests. Other great heroes joined him, Durgan, the fearless dwarven warrior from the world's edge mountains. Ladril, the elven fighter mage from distant Athalorn, and Telor the wizard, whose sorcery was to save Rogar on many occasions. Now, those of you who pledged the mythic tier for Hasbro's 2021 remake will recognize Telor, the prophecy of Telor. So Stephen Baker, the original designer of Hero Quest, the OG, as, as I call him, he uh, wrote a new quest book, which was only for the mythic tier. So it was 13 quests called Prophecy of Telor. So it's kind of cool that he uh, came back and tied that together. He also made a quest called Rogar's Hall, which was released as a free quest. Um, but more on that at, at, at another time. If you, if you just uh, look up Rogar's Hall, you'll find that one. It's kind of an experimental kind of training quest. But it's incredibly difficult. So anyway, continuing. For, uh, this is uh, the uh, 1989 EU premier edition or first edition hero quest rule, rules of play book for many years uh, rogar trained his army being careful to avoid open battle with morkar's general until all was ready but ever harried their supply lines wiping out countless orcs and goblins then came the day for which rogar had waited his army had grown strong and was well practiced camping in the high passes 
Ladril saw the black host from afar and bade Durgan blow the call to arms on his mighty horn. Rogar's army poured down upon the enemy from two sides and battle was joined. Many foul creature and good men perished that day. Yet, as the light of day faded, it was darkness that fled the field. But the victory was not absolute. Morkar and his general escaped beyond the Sea of Claws, and even now they plot their revenge. Soon their plots will be ready, and the Empire will have need of a new Rogar. But where are the heroes to equal him? You have much to learn if you are to become as great as Rogar and his companions. I will help all I can. The book I carry, Lortome, was written when time began. All that ever was and all that ever will be is recorded in its countless pages. Through Lortome I may guide you, but I may not intervene lest a greater evil befell the world and chaos triumph forever. There's Mentor Seal, and that's page two. So continuing on, Hero Quest. Now this is very, very similar to the second edition, the one that I read on a previous video. That was from 1990. But there are some subtle differences, so I'll just go ahead and go through this quickly. So 35 Citadel miniatures, its contents. 31 monsters, 8 orcs, 6 goblins, 3 femur, 4 chaos warriors, 1 chaos sorcerer, 1 gargoyle, 4 skeletons, 2 zombies, 2 mummies, and 4 heroes, 1 wizard, 1 elf, 1 dwarf, 1 barbarian, 1 quest book, 1 game board, 1 screen, 15 pieces of furniture, 2 tables, 1 throne, 1 alchemist bench, Three treasure chests, one tomb, one sorcerer's table, two bookcases, one rack, one fireplace, one weapons rack, and one cupboard. 21 closed doors, five closed and 16 open. Oh, I forgot to mention, if you're a collector or if you're just going on eBay or wherever looking for pieces, one way you can easily tell the difference between the miniatures for this edition or the European second edition and the North American version is the miniatures themselves, the bases, so the North American version, they're just little squares. Actually, they're squeezed hex hexagons, but it's nice and smooth around the edge. The European version has got a little bevel around the edge, a little uh, crease or cut on, around the edge. So it's a quick way to tell. And the colors are slightly different. They're a little more vibrant or brighter, reds and greens and things. And the undead are actually white instead of being yellowish or dark green or dark red like the North American version. So anyway, uh, eight single blo uh, blocked square flying block trap tiles. Yeah, another thing, the, um, the North American version has skull tiles and it has like the single blocked squares and the double block squares. They look like nice bricks. Whereas in this version, they're just piles of rubble. So they're just like clumps of rock. Whereas the North American version uses the clumps of rock rubble as the falling block or falling rock trap tiles. So it's just kind of an interesting thing there. Uh, so we've got eight of those single blocked square falling block slash falling block trap tiles. So they double up. Two double blocked square tiles, four pit trap tiles, one stair tile, four secret door tiles, 64 playing cards, three fire spells, three earth spells, three water spells, three air spells, five quest treasures, 25 treasure cards, and the treasure deck is different in this versus the North American version. And 14 equipment cards. Now, the North American version had no equipment deck. The remake has an equipment deck, but the North American version that U.S. players are familiar with had an armory board. So it's just a, a big platform that had a, like a menu where you would buy your equipment from. And eight monster cards. Four character boards. One elf, one wizard, one dwarf, and one barbarian. One pad of character sheets. Two standard dice. So it's your movement dice. Four special combat dice. Yes, four combat dice, not six. The plastic monster and hero models have been specially designed by Citadel Miniatures. And I think they did a great job. Assembly. Before you can begin to play Hero Quest, there are several plain pieces which need to be assembled. Detailed assembly instructions can be found on the inside of the game box lid. Sorry, it's uh, <clears throat> it's really dry this time of year, and my voice is not not perfect here. Hero Quest is a trademark owned by Games Workshop Limited, used with permission. All right, here we go. So this is page four. Introduction. 
HeroQuest is a game of adventure, set in a land besieged by the forces of chaos. Mentor, the mysterious and ancient wizard sage, has summoned four valiant adventurers to undertake the challenge of becoming heroes and saving the land. The rules are structured to teach the game in stages, and each main section is introduced by Mentor, your teacher. The easiest way to learn how to play is for all the players to read through this book together, following the instructions as you read. Starting the game. The game is for two to five players. One player must act as Morkar, the evil wizard, and control his force of monsters. This player is called the evil wizard player. The other players control the four would-be heroes, the elf, dwarf, wizard, and barbarian. These players are called player characters. Choosing roles. I thought this part was neat. Each player rolls a standard die. The highest scorer chooses his role first. One player must act as the evil wizard player. The last player to choose a role must play the part of the evil wizard if no one has already chosen to do so. If there are fewer than five players, you may either take more than one character each or use fewer than four characters. This will make the game much harder for the player characters, but any treasure they find will be split between fewer characters. Good point. Setting up the game. Each of the player characters should take the following. The appropriate plastic model and matching character board plus a character sheet from the pad. The evil wizard player takes the screen, the quest book, and the playing cards. He should also have all the monster models, tiles, and furniture pieces close to hand. The evil wizard player sits behind the screen and arranges the board so that the words Hero Quest face him. Now in the remake, of course, they put Hero Quest on the side of the board instead of the bottom so they could uh, make the squares larger. So that's different. But uh, anyway, um, he sorts the cards into their various categories, treasure, monsters, equipment, spells, and quest treasures. The shuffled treasure cards should be placed face down within reach of the player characters. The monster card should be kept face up behind the screen. So that's different. Normally, I when I play, I put the monster cards out so the heroes can see them. But the reason they do this is because on the European um, game screen, the one that shows the wizard in red, who in this version is supposed to be um, Mentor, not Morkar, oddly enough. Well, anyway, that screen doesn't show the monster stats, whereas in the North American version, it does show the monster stats. So the screens are actually different. The European screen, I believe it shows the furniture. And so it's like to help him with placing stuff on the map. So that would be the reason he keeps the monster cards to look at. So makes sense until you memorize them, of course. Okay, the quest book and the other cards are not needed just yet. Put them to one side. Finally, the player characters fill in their character sheets according to the details on their character boards. Now, I like the uh, North American uh, version because it's nice and organized as far as the character sheet goes. But the original version of the character sheet for the European version has this big coat of arms, like a blank shield that you can decorate. So I can just picture players, you know, sitting there doodling while they're waiting for their turn, you know, designing their stuff. Of course, you'd always have that kid who is working too hard on his and it's like, hey, it's your turn. Like, oh, sorry. You know, the game goes on and on. It's distracted. Now, now what happened? What just happened? So here we got page five, character boards and sheets. The character board tells the players how many dice to roll and the character sheets are used to record each character's progress during the game. Each board has a picture of the character plus the following details. And actually the European version was recommended for age nine and up. Whereas the North American version, they changed it to age 10 and up. And in the remake, they say 14 and up. 14? What? (laughs) And I've discussed this many, many more times. Why 14 specifically? I guess I've been told, and maybe this is true in the industry, is that like they have to, a company has to actually pay more money to have their game tested to make sure it's like completely safe for kids under a certain age before they can approve it. And so it's not just a recommendation based on complexity or, oh, does it contain mature content? It's, uh, you know, for safety reasons. I mean, there's no, like, lead in the paint or anything like that. But Advanced Hero Quest, for example, in Europe, said age 14 and up due to pointy swords. <laughs> yes, sharp, sharp edges. And, of course, you know, small parts for under three 
but anyway so 14 so i guess they didn't they didn't want to pay the money to have it tested because really it's for it's for nine or ten year olds and up you just got to be able to read and follow directions okay so each board has a picture of the character plus the following details character type notice they don't call it class or race they just call it character type copy this into the box provided on the character sheet this will be wizard barbarian dwarf or elf body this is the measure of your character's physical strength copy the number shown into the body box on your character sheet during the game you may gain or lose body points keep track of your current score on your character sheet if the total ever reaches zero your character is dead lost body points can be healed by magic spells and potions this magic will never take the total above its starting number however it will only restore lost body points mind this is the measure of your character's wisdom copy the number shown into the mind box on your character sheet during the game you may gain or lose mind points keep track of your current score on your character sheet if the total ever reaches zero your character is dead so zero mind points dead mind points will become more important in future expansions to the hero quest game and as we know there was uh, Keller's Keep and Return of the Witch Lord after this, and in the European market, they also got Against the Ogre Horde, The Dark Company, which was part of Advanced Quest, um, which was a special version of the game system, and then um, Wizards of Morcar. Whereas the North American version, yes, you got Keller's Keep and Return of the Witch Lord, but then you got the Elf Quest Pack, which was Mage of the Mirror, and the Barbarian Quest Pack, the Frozen Horror. And of course, in the remake era, we have the mythic tier stuff, and they're talking about remaking uh, the Barbarian Quest back, but we'll see what else comes out. For now, with the retail game, all you get is the game system, and then if you can find a copy of Keller's Keeper, Return of the Witch Lord, and then the Night expansion, which is super hard to get now because they underestimated uh, the supply versus the pre-orders. So, but that's another that's another topic for another video. Sorry to get off track there. Here we're focusing on the 1989 HeroQuest Rules of Play, the premier edition, the first edition. Okay. So the rest of the information on the character board, attack, defend, move, is explained later in this rule book. Now you must think of a name for your character and write it in the box provided on your sheet. For example, the elf might be called Ladril. The dwarf could be called Grugni. I always misread that as grungy, <laughs> grungy. Uh, the wizard might be Zoltan. Zoltan. That kind of reminds me of a uh, big that uh, Tom Hanks movie where he, the kid turns into an adult. Zoltan. Uh, I could be wrong about that. The barbarian Sigmar. Of course, Warhammer fantasy fans know who Sigmar is, and so on. Use whatever name you feel is appropriate. Finally, a blank shield is provided on each character sheet for you to design your own coat of arms and, and motto. Oh yeah, I forgot about the motto. So yeah, Semper Fidelis or whatever you think uh, would be good. Semper Fi. Um, yeah, another thing is the European market got a, a package called the Adventure Design Kit. It's just a box that you open up. One little design thing that I think the North American version did better is the boxes had like a, a lid that comes off like a two-part box, whereas the European versions, it was just a box that you, you know, pop the top and then take the stuff out. So, you know, they would get ratty and ripped up over time, unless you were super careful with them. But collectors, you know, they're going to track down that box. It's in perfect condition. I guess you could flatten it out. But anyway, the Adventure Design Kit had a redesigned version of the European um, character sheet. So it was better organized and it was bigger too, so that you could fit more on it and of course you could always write on the back too uh, in the remake they made sure to make the character sheets bigger as well so easier to write on um, the uh, the blank shield and the motto is a unique feature of the european version and the, the adventure design kit has a smaller version of the shield so you know you couldn't do it super detailed you know get your box of crayons and color pencils out and really go to town and make a really fancy uh, shield i suppose you could even well, 
if you had a miniature that had a the guy carrying a shield, you could like paint it to match. That would be pretty fun. Be pretty cool. None of the default heroes uh, had a shield, but with the adventure design kit, my point is they had a sticker sheet, and the sticker sheet had all the symbols like from the bank blank quest at the end. So instead of having to cut it out, you would just like peel off the sticker and you could make your own quest. And there was like five. I should review that one in another episode. But anyway, um, they did have one. It was a, a champion symbol. So you could peel off this special sticker, like if you became a champion, and you could put it on your coat of arms to say, hey, I, uh, I achieved champion status. But anyway, I'll talk more about that as we get to it. Okay. The quest book. This book should be kept hidden from the player characters. It contains details of a number of quests, showing the evil wizard player which monsters he has to control for each quest and where they start on the board. You will not be using this book until you have learned how the rest of the game works. How to use the quest book is explained later in these rules. Monster cards. These cards are used by the evil wizard player. There is one card for each type of monster. They show how many dice to roll during the game. So that's page five, moving to page six, 1989 rules here. Premier edition. The Way of the Warrior. Now, this is a unique section. I don't think this appears in any, any other version, um, as you'll soon see. The Way of the Warrior. The underground strongholds of Morkar are filled with many ferocious monsters, from foul orcs and lizard-like fimmer to terrifying undead skeletons and zombies. If you are to survive, you must learn the art of combat. There's Mentor Seal there. Order of Play. Each player moves in turn, starting with the player to the left of the evil wizard player and continuing clockwise. When it is your turn, you may both move and fight. You may move first, then fight, or fight first, then move. You may not take part of your move, fight, then finish your move. On his turn, the evil wizard player may move some or all of his monsters currently on the game board. He moves each monster in turn. Monsters may first move, then attack, or attack, then move, as do the player characters. Now some of this artwork uh, you may recognize from Warhammer Fantasy. They liberally copied it back and forth um, from I think third edition, which is hard to find these days into Hero Quest. But in the as the versions went on, like the North American version doesn't have it all. The second edition even removed some of the artwork, but it's cool nonetheless. So I think that's supposed to be a I'm maybe saying this wrong, Britannian Knight versus a Chaos Warrior. It's kind of a cool little thing, just for, for fun, for flavor. Movement. The squares on the board are divided into two types of area, rooms and passages. So they call them passages here instead of corridors. The rooms are enclosed by white lines, the walls. The passages are shown by the areas with light gray flooring. Passages may be one or two squares wide. The character boards show how many dice to roll to determine how many squares can be moved. Characters do not have to move the maximum distance indicated by the total of the dice. The monster cards simply show the maximum number of squares that may be moved by each monster of that type. When moving, characters and monsters may not move diagonally, move through the same square twice, so that's something, move onto an occupied square. Characters and monsters may, however, pass through an occupied square, provided that the player controlling the obstructing model allows you to pass. <laughs> I think of Gandalf, you shall not pass. Otherwise, you must take another route or stop. Only one model can occupy a square. Obviously, that would be different with the staircase, but I'll try to keep my editorial comments to a minimum here because we're just going through familiarizing you with the rules and thinking about the differences. Once a character or monster has finished moving, he may attack if he has not already done so. Play then passes to the next player on his left. So there's a nice illustration there. Having rolled a five, the elf character finds two of his possible routes blocked by orcs. The wizard will let him pass, however. So there's the elf, there's an orc, and he rolled a five. So go there past the wizard, but he can't go past the orc. I know this is a little dry in more ways than one, but we're just continuing on. I don't mind if you listen to this at uh, maximum speed in the playback. 
So here we've got page 8 for those following along at home. Combat. Combat is split into two stages, attack and defense. Attacking. To attack a monster or a character, see they, they say character instead of hero here, you must be in one of four squares, to the side, front, or rear. You cannot attack diagonally. Example, the elf may attack from any of the squares where he is shown in the diagram. He may not attack from any of the squares marked X. See, so there you've got the, uh, the elf could attack the orc, any of those adjacent squares. To attack, you must roll a number of the special combat dice with shields and skulls. The number of dice to roll is shown on the character boards and monster cards against attack. For each skull you roll, the opponent will lose one body point unless he can successfully defend himself. If you fail to roll any skulls, the attack is wasted and your opponent need not defend. Defending. To defend against a successful attack, a player rolls the number of special combat dice shown on his character board or monster card against defend. The player characters must try to roll white shields. While the monster sorry while well, the monsters need round black ones each shield rolled provided is it is the correct type cancels one skull rolled by the attacker so veteran players already know this but just interesting to go through once the result of the defense has been determined the player who has attacked who was attacked must reduce his body point score on his character sheet by one point for every skull not canceled by a shield when a character's body points reach zero the character is dead. Since all the monsters have only one body point in this version, they are killed by any roll of a skull which is not canceled by rolling a black shield. So as you can see there, the, the monsters have weaker defense than the heroes generally. Dead characters and monsters are immediately removed from play. The attacker may now move if he has not already done so. Play then passes to the player on his left. Here's a new section, the arena. Mentor has provided a magical arena for you to practice moving and fighting. Use the board without any furniture for this fight to the death. So it's kind of a little mini scenario right here. Each player character puts his model in one of the corners in the large room in the center of the board. The evil wizard player places five goblins anywhere he likes in the room. The player to the left of the evil wizard player goes first. The last character, or monster, left alive wins. At the end of the fight, the magic of the arena restores all characters to full strength. All wounds are healed. You should practice in the arena as many times as you need to feel confident with the way of the warrior. So, that sounds like you could have four heroes fighting those five goblins in that room, or you could have one hero or whatever combination. Page 9. Again, a unique section. The Way of the Wizard. Force of arms alone will not suffice to defeat the forces of chaos. You will need to draw on the ancient power of magic if you are to achieve the final victory. Two of you have the ability to learn a little of this arcane lore. But remember, you cannot cast spells at something you cannot see. So there we got some cool illustrations again. Warhammer fantasy stuff. Choose, and I, I think, I'm not sure exactly with these, but I think Gary Chalk, so fans of uh, Lone Wolf, the Lone Wolf uh, series of fantasy game novels from um, the 1980s and the 1990s. I'm trying to think of a few were released in the 2000s. I think it was 80s and 90s. Yeah, Flight from the Dark was the first one. Uh, Joe Deaver, who passed away uh, not too long ago, unfortunately, um, he was the author, the writer, and then Gary Chalk was the illustrator for Lone Wolf. And I think Gary Chalk was one of the illustrators for Warhammer Fantasy as well. So you, you'll you recognize some of his artwork in the classic editions of HeroQuest and also in the Warhammer books. So he's not the only illustrator, but a lot of it is either done directly by him or um, inspired by him. Now that's not to take anything away from Les Edwards, who did the painting that is the cover of the HeroQuest box. And he also did the paintings for Keller's Keep and Return of the Witch Lord, which were ported straight over into the European versions. But in the North American versions, they like edited his artwork a little bit. I don't know if he did the new version, but they like changed a few things around. 
And then in the remake, of course, they have brand new artwork, but it's clearly inspired by Les Edwards. And some of it's inspired by the Gary Chalk stuff too, but he had a very distinctive style. He really liked to show all the warts and scars and, you know, little hairs on, on his characters. Um, gritty, kind of dirty, used universe. Anyway, um, choosing spells. Sort the 12 spell cards into their four sets. Each set corresponds to a different aspect of magical energy. Oh, and Gary Chalk is still alive. He's still with us as far as I, as far as I know. But yeah, a lot of nostalgia around his artwork. Okay, choose the 12 spell cards into their four, or sort the 12 spell cards into their four sets. Each set corresponds to a different aspect of magical energy. Earth magic, water magic, air magic, and fire magic. There are three spell cards in each set. At the start of each game, the wizard chooses three sets of spells, nine cards, and the elf chooses one set, three cards. The wizard chooses one set first, then the elf chooses a set, and finally the wizard takes the remaining two sets. So there they've got pictures. And the European cards, you can tell the difference right away from the North American cards, is the European cards have like a white border, or, you know, I guess it'd be like manila colored, probably now, because it's faded, but yellowed with age. But yeah, a white border around the edge. And the artwork has kind of more of a drawing or comic book drawing style. Like, we're talking classic comic books, like Silver Age comics, like 70s, 80s, like how the, they looked. Whereas the North American version, the, the the card backs look like they're painted. So they look more like, like oil paintings. So it's a different style. But yeah, the white borders are in the European version. And then on the opposite side of the card, they have these borders, which actually kind of look like these borders here. These kind of, But they're brown or kind of reddish brown borders, whereas the North American version just doesn't have that border at all. So it's pretty easy. And I think the European version cards are slightly smaller in size. The uh, North American cards are U.S. game card size, but they're actually one millimeter taller than the standard U.S. game card size or American uh, game deck size. So if you're trying to make your own cards and make it match perfectly, that's what you would go for. But anyway, enough about that. There's just so much lore and trivia to talk about. And a lot of the stuff I didn't even know uh, until the early 2000s, really, until I started researching other versions of the game. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, playing in 1991 or 92 or whatever, it was just what you had in the box, and that was it. You didn't know the rest of the world existed. Sorry, losing my voice a little bit here, sorry. Okay, so this is page 10. Casting spells. Okay, skid up. Excuse me. A little swig of uh, sweet tea there. <clears throat> oh boy. Okay, casting spells. Sorry, I just need a minute here. <clears throat> Get all emotional about this uh, nostalgia. I'm just kidding. No, it's just my uh, voice is a little bit uh, scratchy, but I'll power through. We've got, um, let's see, 15 pages. We'll make it. All right, casting spells. When it is their turn, the wizard and elf characters have the option of casting a spell instead of attacking. A spell may be cast before or after moving. You cannot use part of your move, cast a spell, and then move again. Spells can be cast at monsters or characters provided they are visible to the spellcaster. Models in the same room as the spellcaster are always visible. Models in passages or in different rooms are only visible if you can trace an unobstructed straight line from the spellcaster to the target. If the line passes through another model, through a wall, or through a closed door, then the target model is not visible. So that's how they interpret it. And there's the drawing. The infamous drawing. So we've got the elf here, and you've got orc, orc, closed door block, edge block. You can see that one, even though that's it's not a like straight diagonal. It's uh, it's kind of clipping, just barely clipping the the wizard's um, square. And of course, the wizard blocks the area to that orc, but then diagonal he can go to that orc and that orc. 
And this is when he's in a passage or corridor. When he's in a room, it's a little bit easier to hit stuff. So you could be in a room and he could just fire a spell or a crossbow and it wouldn't have to be a straight line. So there, that is a difference than the North American version. The North American version was much more strict in terms of aiming. So there you've got the, the ray representing the clear line of sight and then the dotted line with the X block line of sight. If a player character tries to cast a spell at a model which is not visible to the caster, the spell has no effect and is wasted. The spellcaster may always cast a spell on himself. Each spell may be cast just once during the course of each quest. Once cast or wasted, the spell card is discarded and cannot be used again in that game. Now, I think when we played in the North American rules, we never wasted spells. It was always just... Well, I guess there were a few instances where like the boss character could only be affected by certain things, and we'd say, oh, you know, it had no effect. But usually it'd just be like, you can't do that. And so they go, oh, okay, fine, I won't do that then. So a little more forgiving. So return to the arena. Again, another little side training quest type thing on page 10 here. To try out your newly acquired magical powers, you must now re-enter Mentor's Arena. The wizard and the elf choose their spells. Each player puts his model in one of the corners in the large room in the center of the board. The evil wizard player places five goblins anywhere in the room. The player to the left of the evil wizard player goes first. Once again, it is a fight to the death. The last character or monster left alive wins. At the end of the fight, the magic of the arena restores all characters to full strength. All wounds are healed. You should practice in the arena as many times as you need to feel confident with the way of the wizard. Now, it doesn't say here that the, the heroes have to help, you know, help each other and work together. So in theory, they could, you know, it's a fight to the death. So the elf and the wizard could be trying to kill each other as well as the goblins. So that could be an interesting way for them to learn teamwork. It's like, okay, uh, if we work together, we're going to win this a lot easier than if we fight each other. So start some early rivalries or whatever. Kids can be competitive. I think Stephen Baker was interviewed once and he said, well, you know, if, if the heroes work together, it's a pretty easy game. If they don't work together, that's where the challenge comes in. But in the North American version, they basically made it impossible for you to hurt each other. Unless, you know, Zargon took control of a hero using the command spell, the very rare Chaos Command spell. So to compensate, they made the monsters have more body points and stuff like that. But then they let you stockpile potions and sell back stuff to the armory for half price to get more money. And um, they let you come back from death if you had a spare healing potion. So, you know, the difficulty goes back and forth. But I think most people agree that the North American rules are, are harder. So it depends on what you're going for. Are you going for challenge or just more for exploration and fun? Especially if you're playing with young kids who are still uh, still learning, still learning to be good sports. This is page 11. The Way of the Scout. It's another unique section here from the other versions. You have one more skill to learn. On your adventures, you will enter many dark and dangerous places. You must learn to be observant, lest you fall into Mar Morkar's cunning traps. Um, miss hidden treasure, or fail to spot secret doors. All this is the way of the scout. The quest book. You are almost ready to start on your adventures. It is time for the evil wizard player to open the quest book. Now, if I were preparing this for a group of little kids, I would be reading a lot faster, or I'd be summarizing, depending on how patient they are. It's like, come on, hurry up. The quest book contains 14 separate quests, adventures with different objectives that the player characters must achieve in order to win. Each quest shows a map of the underground stronghold where the action takes place. The maps are marked with symbols showing the starting positions of the monsters which are controlled by the evil wizard player. These symbols are the same as those on each of the monster cards. The maps also show where to place the furniture pieces, uh, doors, and blocked square tiles. In addition, there are symbols for traps, secret doors, and treasure chests. These symbols are also shown on the evil wizard player's screen. I like that, that art there. Some type of bad guy. I don't know, is that is that what uh, is that what Morkar looks like? Who knows, right? So in the North American version, we always assume the evil Santa figure, this this guy here, was Zargon, the evil wizard player. But according to Stephen Baker, according to the remake, this was always meant to be Mentor, so which confused the heck out of us. 
So it's like, well, what does Morkar look like? Who knows? Does he look like Skeletor with a hood on? Does he look like one of these guys? I think that's supposed to be a Chaos Cultist, if I know my Warhammer fantasy lore, which I don't. I'm still learning it. But uh, Warhammer fans can correct me on that. <clears throat> Page 12, getting close to the end here. Moving around the board. As the characters explore Morkar's dungeons, they enter new rooms and passages. If you are the first player to enter a new room or passageway, you should give the evil wizard player enough time to consult the quest book and place onto the board any visible monsters and furniture. I agree with that sentiment there. As one who often plays as the evil wizard player. Opening doors. Characters and monsters can only enter and leave rooms through open doors. Monsters cannot open doors. You can open a door by moving onto the square in front of it. You do not have to open a door if you do not want to. Opening a door does not count as a move. Having opened a door, you can keep moving if you have any spaces left to move. As soon as the door is opened, the evil wizard player must place any pieces shown for that room or passage on the map in the quest book, apart from traps and secret doors. I will admit, playing as Zargon, sometimes, you know, I'm just tired or distracted or whatever, and I've forgotten to put stuff out. That's not the player's fault. If, you know, too much time goes by, I'll just let it go, and and hopefully the quest still works with, with, uh, with my mistake. But you don't have to tell them you made a mistake. Once opened, a door remains open for the rest of the game. The evil wizard player should remove the closed door piece and replace it with an open door. Note that because you may not move through the same square twice in one move, if you move through a door, you may not pass through it again until your next turn. <clears throat> Excuse me. Searching. Characters may always search instead of making an attack or casting a spell. The search can be made before or after moving. Characters may not search if they are next to a monster or if there is a monster in the same room or visible in a passage. Monsters never search. Let me just double check something here. Yeah, I think we might have an error in the stream here. I do apologize for technical issues. Hopefully we're still live, still recording. Not, I may have to redo this. Just double check the stream here. Yeah, some of the issues we've been having is, is due to the, uh, the heat. Heat's not good for the circuits, right? I mean, it's, it's due to the, uh, the heat. Oh, good, we're still Heat's recording. Not, not good for the circuits. All right. So let me go back to my thing there. Sorry about the technical issues, folks. Okay. So as you'll see in this version, searching is different in the European version than the North American version. In North American version, there's searching for traps, searching for secret doors, searching for treasure. Here, there's just two, as you'll see. A whole room or all visible squares of a passage may be searched in one turn. Players must tell the evil wizard player what they're looking for. They may search for either secret doors and traps or treasure. If there is anything to be found, the evil wizard player must reveal it. Searching for treasure will not reveal traps or secret doors and vice versa. Secret doors and traps. Notice how it's a single action. Secret door tiles are only placed on the board if a player character finds them by searching. Trap tiles are only placed if found by a search or if triggered by a character moving onto the trap square. Spear traps are always disarmed when found, so there is no spear there are no spear trap tiles. That's different. Pit traps and falling block traps are placed onto the board when found. They may later be disarmed and removed by the dwarf or any character with the toolkit equipment card. Once found, secret doors remain open for the rest of the game. So that's page 12. So just in case we had any issues with the stream, I'm going to go back to show you the previous page. See there? And we were back here. So if you want to reorient yourself, the rules of play, 1989 version. Okay, so back to page 13. Treasure. 
Some of the quests provide details about specific treasures which can be found by searching. If a character searches for a treasure in the appropriate room or passage, the evil wizard player follows the instructions in the quest book. If there is no treasure listed for the room or passage being searched, the character must take the top card from the face down stack of treasure cards. See, they're very specific about that. So none of this, you know, spreading it out on the table and grabbing a random one or pick a card, any card type of thing. In the premier edition, this is how they intended it. Monsters may not move treasure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Treasure cards. Some of the treasure cards are of gold or jewels. The character who finds one of these should record the value of his character of his character sheet should record the value of his character sheet and return the card to the bottom of the treasure deck. Some treasure cards show potions. You can either use such a card immediately, returning the card to the bottom of the stack, so not discarded, that's interesting, or keep it and use it later at any time. Return the card to the bottom of the stack as soon as it is used. So that's different than other versions where you have a discard pile. The other treasure cards show traps or wandering monsters. These cards should be read out and the instructions followed immediately. Wandering monsters. Some of the treasure cards do not show any treasure at all. Instead, they show a ferocious monster. Each quest in the quest book tells the evil player what sort of monster model to use when one of these cards is found. If all the monsters of a particular type are on the board and the evil wizard player needs to place another one, he may use any other monster provided that it is the same color as the one that should have been used. Okay, just double checking the stream there. Okay, the screen. The maps in the quest book use the symbol shown on the inside of the screen to represent the various pieces of furniture, monsters, and traps. As I mentioned, the GM screen or Zargon screen, or I guess this, this would be the Morkar screen, um, the back of it is different in the different versions. So here we're talking about the premier edition of the EU, European or UK version. Traps. Traps are triggered whenever a character moves onto a trap square or opens a trap chest without searching. See? The evil wizard player must tell a player character when he has set off a trap. The character must stop immediately and can do nothing else until his next turn. Blocked square tiles. These tiles should be placed according to the map in the quest book as soon as they become visible to a player character. These tiles show where extra walls have been built or where the ceiling has fallen in. Neither characters nor monsters may move through blocked squares. So on to page 14. Thanks for everybody enduring with me here as we go through the rules. The maze. Turn to the quest called the maze. So of course the maze does not appear in the North American version. This is a final test for the player characters before they begin their adventures proper. The evil wizard player reads the text in bold type to the other players. This is how all the quests start. The evil wizard player should also read through the other notes before the game begins to himself, <laughs> obviously. In some quests, these notes will contain details of special rules that only apply to that quest. To play the maze, each player character places his model in one corner of the board. The evil wizard player checks the map and places on the board any pieces, doors, furniture, monsters, block squares, that are visible to any of the player characters. Do not put out any secret door or trap tiles. The player character can only find these by searching. As the players move their models, the evil wizard player must keep checking the map and put out any pieces that become visible. Play through this trial quest as many times as you like. At the end of each game, the characters are restored to full strength and the evil wizard player gets a new set of monsters. So see that? So it's different than the trial where you could all be killed in the first quest. And you'll retry it and Zargon's supposed to kind of mix it up a little bit so it's not exactly the same. Well, in this one, you just you get a free game. You just keep playing, playing the, the maze over and over until you feel like you're ready to move on. It's like it doesn't count in your overall campaign. The quests. Once you have played through the maze, you are ready to undertake the other quests. These should be played in the order in which they appear. As with the maze, each begins with a section in bold type, which the evil wizard player reads out loud to the other players. He should also read through the other notes, which detail, for example, which 
uh, where certain special treasures are hidden, how powerful a monster is, and whether there are any special rules that apply to that quest. Setting up a quest. Usually the player characters start from the room marked with the stairway tile. In some quests, however, the other players start from a different room. The quest details will explain what to do in these cases. The stairway leads out of the stronghold to safety. Place the stairway tile in the room shown. The player characters place their models on any square next to the stairway, as opposed to on the stairway, like in the North American version. The contents of this room, barring any traps, secret doors, or treasure, should be laid out at the beginning of the game. All doors are closed. No pieces outside this room are placed on the board. These should only be set up where the player characters can see them by moving into a new room or passage. Quest treasures. There are five special quest treasures. Uh, excuse me, five special treasure cards. Quest tre So notice how they're called quest treasures here instead of artifacts like they are in the North American version. And if you look at the card, which I don't have here, um, it doesn't have any text. It's just a picture of Mentor's book, which you could presume is lore tome, perhaps. So there are five special quest treasure cards. The Wand of Recall, which is called the Wand of Magic in the North American version, the Magical Sword, Oryx Bane, the Talisman of Lore, Boren's Armor, and the Spirit Blade. Notice how the North American version added some others to that list. Do not mix these cards in with the ordinary treasure cards. They can only be found according to the notes in the quest book. All right, page 15, the final page. Crossing the finish line. Okay, completing a quest. The player characters complete a quest successfully if they achieve the objectives described in the passage in bold type which the evil wizard player reads aloud at the beginning of the game. If they fail to do so, or if they are killed, the evil wizard wins. Because, in theory, they could retreat to the stairs and just give up. Of course, surviving player characters and or new ones can always attempt the same quest again, but the evil wizard player always starts a quest with a full complement of monsters. Buying equipment. If your character survives, if your character survives, you may keep him and use him again in subsequent quests. In this case, you may keep any quest treasure cards and you may spend any treasure recorded on your character sheet on purchasing better equipment, armor, weapons, and so on. You may not keep ordinary treasure cards. So see that? So in the North American version, you can stockpile all kinds of potions and things. In this version, if you didn't use it, you lose it, unless it's an artifact or quest treasure, rather. Or your regular gold. There is a card for each item of equipment available for purchase. Okay, so this was a point of contention. A lot of people read this and said, okay, does this mean that if there's only two, um, like two uh, sh uh, shields or two helmets, like you only have two cards, does that mean that you can't buy any more than that? Like if those are purchased, that's it? Well, apparently, that may be what they intended here. The Japanese version is symbol. Uh, sorry, can't even talk now. The Japanese version is similar to this. So in the Japanese version explicitly, if you've only got like two short swords or whatever, um, then there's only two to purchase. That's it. You know, if there's only two potions of healing, then there's only two potions of healing. And you got to wait until it's used up or somebody else has bought uh, died or whatever that you can get it again. Whereas in this one, um, it appears to be that way. But in all the other versions, the second edition, the remake, the North American version, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can buy infinite. As long as you can afford it, you can buy it. Okay, so there is a card for each item of equipment available for purchase. Now, you could read that and say, well, yeah, but that just means that, okay, for every card, that's that item exists. But does that mean that? Well, they give you duplicates, so I think I think it is. I think I go with those who are saying that it it means it limits the supply or the stock. Any player wishing to buy equipment should take the card they want, reduce the money on their sheet by the value shown in the card, and make a note of the benefits of the equipment on their sheet. Now, if you really wanted to follow the rules strictly and uh, find a loophole, you just buy yourself a second set of hero quests. Now you've got more cards to buy. <laughs> I guess. The spear and the staff, for example, allow characters to attack diagonally. A character may not buy equipment if he does not have enough money to do so. But money can be accumulated and kept from quest to quest. Now, it doesn't say you, you can't pull your money, but it also doesn't say that you can in this version. 
Missile weapons. Some weapons may be thrown, while the crossbow may be fired. While firing the crossbow or throwing a weapon, the procedure for rolling combat dice to attack and defend remains the same. Your target must be visible as with casting a spell. There's no maximum range for firing the crossbow or throwing a weapon. However, you may do neither if you're in one of the squares next to your target. Becoming a champion. Here we go. This is unique to this version. If you use the same character from quest to quest, you may reach the coveted status of champion. Each time your character completes a quest, write the name of the quest in the box marked tasks completed on your character sheet. So that's different than the North American version where you just have numbers 1 through 14 that you circle or cross off. Once you have completed three quests, the land's grateful emperor will make you a champion. You will receive 500 extra gold coins, which you may spend on better equipment. So this premier edition, that's completely unique. The 500 gold reward for becoming a champion. Uh, in the second edition, you become a champion after three quests completed successfully, but you don't get any reward. And in the North American version, you're declared a champion if you defeat the Witch Lord in quest 14, I believe. So, and no reward. Okay, so that concludes our read-through of the 1989 Premier Edition, first edition. Just one moment here. And we're back. So welcome back once again to HeroQuest fans. We're not restarting the stream. I'll just go ahead and edit out uh, the the dead air there. But uh, now that we've discussed the rules for the 1989 Premier Edition, what we're going to do is we're going to go through, just as a bonus, as I promised, some of these homebrew things that I've done. Now, I'm not claiming to be an expert painter or anything. I'm definitely not an expert sculptor. I was trying to <laughs> recreate using green stuff some uh, damaged weapons from my Battlemaster set, and they did not turn out very well. They looked very, very crude, which is fine if you're trying to do like Stone Age spears or something, but if you're trying to recreate like a battle axe, I was thinking, gee, I really need to get access to a 3D printer and uh, 3D print these, as opposed to buying a brand new uh, replacement. So yeah, so here's some of the stuff that I've done. These are, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and adjust my camera here so you can see a little better. Okay, so this is some 3D printed furniture. Now, a guy was selling these online, actually. There's a lot of people that do this. They'll sell, like, stuff that's 3D printed, so... I don't have my own 3D printer yet. I do know some people that have it, but oddly enough, they're, it's still in the box. So it's a big deal to get it out and start learning how to do it. But uh, anyway, so pretty basic. Just painted a, a little uh, table. Here's another one. So pretty basic paint job. But I like how it's 3D printed, so it kind of looks like it's almost like wood grain like actual wood, but it's plastic. And it's not made out of resin, so it's it's pretty hard. It's pretty strong. It's like it could take a lot of abuse if uh, needed. There's a bookcase. Again, pretty basic. Or, sorry, this is a cupboard, excuse me. I get them confused sometimes. That's a bookcase. So here we've got one that I just, I did kind of the first pass on it. So you can see like the scrolls and the little, I'm not sure if that's supposed to be like a monkey skull. It's pretty big for a rat skull, some kind of animal. But you got the books and then I colored the books there. And yeah, that's supposed to be down there. That's the Hobbit and that's the Lord of the Rings set. Because I have a set that, that has uh, covers that kind of look like that. So not super detailed, but yeah, it's fun to kind of slot paint around. I didn't really want to paint my originals, but I had no no qualms about painting these uh, 3D printed versions. Now, some of the ones in the classic set that I own personally were pre-painted by somebody on eBay. 
maybe not the person I bought it from, but certainly a previous owner. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, this is the Alchemist bench. I'm still actually working on this one. There's still more, more detail that needs to be added. That is considered, I don't know if that's considered flash or whatever that is. That's like extra stuff from the 3D printing process. But I kind of like the fact that it kind of looks like cobwebs. So I think if I add just a little bit of white or gray to that, make it look like uh, like cobwebs. Because, you know, you discover this alchemist bench in the, in the dungeon. And now am I going to put like tiny writing on, that, on those uh, papers? Who knows? Sure, you can see the detail. So that's a fun little little thing. Now there's actually two versions of this fireplace, and yeah, where's the where's the picture here? Maybe I'll. I was kind of thinking about just uh, scanning the picture and just cutting it out on a piece of like card cardstock or something, and just gluing it on there, or maybe a chipboard. But yeah, you got the fireplace, and maybe a little fire. I I kind of like the fact that there's no fire there, but maybe I could put up some like fake logs or ashes or something there simulate the fireplace but i also have some like plastic fire it's it's kind of like a see-through plastic it could be there but yeah there's this one and then there's like a smaller version because the same guy released different 3d prints so this is like the bigger version and this one didn't turn out so well but i mean it was part of a set so there's the weapons rack i don't mean the paint but but look how like knobby that that staff is I mean, a gnarled staff is kind of cool, but it looks like it's at the bottom of the ocean, like it was covered in barnacles or something. So I'm sure there's people out there that can scan stuff at higher resolution and print it at higher resolution, probably for a greater cost, but it is what it is. So weapons rack. And let's see. Oh yeah, here's the other cupboard. So notice the size difference two cupboards so let's put those together you can see there's different sizes and then we've got an interpretation of the torture rack there so very different style of rack than the hero quest classic it's upright Then we've got the uh, sorcerer's table. This kind of looks more like an altar. It's always the, the toss up. It's like, what does a sorcerer's table look like? Does it look like an altar? So anyway, there's that. I didn't paint the bottom. These actually started out gray, but I painted them to look more like the plastic and then just add the details because the originals would have been half cardboard, full color, and then half uh, brown or gray plastic. There's the treasure chess. I like that wood grain effect from the 3D printing process. So I did some of them with gold hinges and some with silver, silver hinges. And I actually used chrome paint, but it doesn't come out super shiny on here. But yeah, so they got the treasure chess. And then there's the throne. Again, an interpretation of the throne. I decided to try to make it look more gaudy. So we've got like glitter paint on there. I don't know if I'm satisfied with the, the paint job. I might do a little bit more with it, but that's about as gaudy as I wanted to make it at the time. So the throne. Oh yeah, another treasure chest. Again, pretty simple. So I'm, I'm learning uh, to paint miniatures, so it's pretty base, starting off pretty basic. There's the uh, throne. I really like how that turned out. I mean, it's 3D printed, obviously, but it, it almost looks like a wood etching or something, or a lithograph in, in relief, like bas relief. So there's the uh, tomb. Tomb. And this is from a different, a different person, but uh, he did a like a Mage of the Mirror, like mirror type, whoops, type door. But I actually 
painted it with uh, Vallejo, not Vallejo, what am I thinking of? Molotol. Vallejo is the acrylic putty, but this is Molotol liquid chrome pen. So you can see it's actually reflective. And there's a couple of ways you can achieve that effect. You can use the expensive pen or you can um, like get some reflective foil or um, like reflective wrapping paper and just kind of like paste a decal on there. But I wanted it so that you could actually see a reflection in there. It's kind of turned out pretty well. Pretty cool. It's supposed to be a magic mirror from the Elf Quest pack. This was another uh, 3D print. I think these these I got from Etsy rather than eBay. So that's supposed to be the Ogre Throne, but they actually made a bigger version of it. And it's uh, got some detail. Um, it's not. I'm not finished painting it yet. It's probably going to have like some black, purple type of detail. But yeah, it's a big, big throne for an ogre to sit on in theory. Now these uh, next ones you're, you're about to see are from Reaper Bones miniatures. And so they're not 3D printed, they're plastic. Uh, but we've got a, another interpretation of the torture rack here. It actually turns. It's just a piece that you stick on. So very basic. I didn't even paint any details on it. Just just wood color. And uh, there's some more in here, but I there was another sorcerer's table, and I, I guess I have it in a different box. So sorry, I don't have that one. It was kind of cool because it had like rust on it. But anyway, these are the candlesticks for it, or candelabra. I had fun with those. So yeah, just like gold candelabra you put around the sorcerer's table so i guess you know you could use it with this one kind of like that you know just like that like so it's for dungeon decoration there was a little uh treasure chest with gold spilling out or gold pile next to a treasure pile so some shiny gold there isn't actually a chrome gold pen like there is a silver chrome with uh, Molotov. And people have tried like mixing colors and it doesn't quite work. So you just you get kind of a dull gold, but it looks it looks good enough for for what you're doing. Everything is just kind of a generic stand in representation of what's there. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Sorry, I do have it. So there is the sorcerer's table I'm talking about. So it's kind of a rust. And there's a little space. I guess you could hide something in there, something small. Put the treasure chest in there. It's pretty obvious. Not, not a very good hiding place. But yeah, it's kind of a metallic. I like the way that turned out, even though it's just really simple, simple colors. It's like Terminator skulls. <laughs> anyway, it's about the right size, too. And then we've got uh, another... The, again, this is Reaper. These are all Reaper bones, these last few that I'm showing you, of the tomb. So an effigy. Effigy tomb. I like the detail on that. On these. Uh, Reaper does a pretty good job. Their bones are plastic. And they've started making them in the USA now, too. So they're a little easier to get and more detailed. But, uh, yeah, so this one. 2016. This one's made in China, though. And, just like the remake, you can open it up so you could... Do something like that. You could put a figure in there, but I mean, they'd have to have a small base to actually work. You could just take the lid off. You could, <laughs> I don't know, just kind of play around with it. So, yeah, those are pretty, pretty fun. So, just working on that dungeon decor. And then I've showed some of this homebrew stuff in, in other uh, videos, but here's some female heroes, character boards. Printed these out. This is shiny, and these are these are pretty thick, actually. See that? Again, just uh, female versions of the classic heroes, just for fun. And those images, I think, are actually from Pathfinder. Found them online, so just modified from. I actually have a miniature like that. So, because Pathfinder stuff is made by Reaper. Um, as well, Reaper Bones. I think Dark Heaven Legends are the what they call the metal ones, and Bones are what they call the plastic ones. And they usually start out as white or like a light gray, and then they have Reaper Bones Black, which are kind of a stiffer plastic, a little easier to paint. 
and so on. And then uh, let's see what else we have. Oh, yeah, I printed out these character sheets. You may have seen these. All I did was I just added the little... See, that's the uh, coat of arms from the European version. Just made a small version of it so you can doodle on there. And there's, like, a, I think 120 instead of 102 or whatever. And then this is this is like what you would get with the Adventure Design Kit. Just going to adjust my camera here so you can see a little better. So the Adventure Design Kit would have had the same style, but it would have been much larger. So this is like a smaller version of that. European style. Um, the only thing I didn't, I didn't make any uh, first or second edition ones, but I like that. And there's your little coat of arms there. Task completed. So this goes right along with what I was saying about um, the, the detail as far as like, you know, you want to do your motto and do a little bit more role playing, more character lore development in between turns. Oh yeah, this tiny, tiny book. This came with a uh, uh, dungeon decor decoration type set. So you could put that on top of the sorcerer's table, like so, or on there, like so. Little book. I suppose you could throw it in the bookcase too, maybe. Does it fit? Yeah, it just kind of disappears into it. But anyway, I've got a whole uh, a whole box of like rubbery plastic type furniture that I may uh, dig out sometime and work on some more paint. It's all just kind of generic brown for now. Other things, I've shown you some of this stuff before. But these tokens, and this is through uh, a site called uh, Board Games Maker. So if you've heard of makeplayingcards.com, this board games maker. And this stuff's a little expensive. It's, I mean, you could do it for prototyping. You could do it for mass, uh, mass production. But this is just for me. So it's a little expensive, but I, I really was curious how it would turn out. And it turned out pretty well. It's pretty, pretty, pretty neat. But the idea behind these, and this is not paid, sponsored, or any, in any way endorsed, for these, I wanted to make tokens for the mercenaries so that you could distinguish like which hero they belong to. So I came up with the idea of just, just doing a really simple system like this. Um, so there we R for ranger, B for barbarian, D for dwarf, W for wizard, E for elf, C for cleric, M for mystic, P for paladin. I mean, I guess what you'd really want to do is maybe just do something around the edge, like the name of, because the, the mini goes right here. But you could just say, oh, well, who does it belong to? Oh, it's the paladin or whatever. And then you could flip this over just as mercenary. So hire some mercenaries. So those are fun. And it's just have a little matte finish on them. Little coins or tokens. So I have a whole bag of those. And other types of things that I had made, I mean, you can you can do this on just chipboard and a glue stick. Just print the stuff out on a color printer and just cut it out yourself. And that's actually the cheaper way to do it. And if you don't mind it having, you know, little rough edges here or there, um, works out pretty well. These, I, um, I call them Zargon coins or Zargon tokens. I just thought it'd be fun to make little uh, little coins. So for me, that's always going to be Zargon. I guess technically it's Mentor, but uh, you can say it's Morkar. So I, I just did a little design. This These are shiny Chaos Elite. So the idea behind these is that you get elite monsters in my homebrew rules, and so then you put that to differentiate them from like regular monsters. So Chaos Elites. So I got a whole bag of those. And these are these are larger size. I think it's like 1.5 inches. So they're technically... These would work a lot better for the remake size on the larger board with the larger squares than they'd work for the classic. I was going to print out some that were smaller size, but at some point... 
what else do we have here? Oh yeah. So I was experimenting with the uh, the ogre tokens, and I think I showed these already, but just showing you again here. So you've got on the back. You know, normally you wouldn't have this black part, but this was like the best size. And I could bring bring the image in a little bit so you can see the full, so it doesn't chop off the top and bottom. But these would be the chaos spells that the bad guys would use, the chaos sorcerers would use in, against the Ogre Horde, which was European-only expansion. So, and there I forgot to, I'm, <laughs> you know, there's no spell check when you're doing an image, so it should be chaos instead of KO. Common mistake. But yeah, it's good enough, though, for what I'm doing. You know, you got a nice little stack of these. So yeah, there's three types. There's <clears throat> Mind Block, Mind Blast, and Dominate. So it's interesting, even though the European version of Hero Quest doesn't have Chaos spells, I mean, they just kind of give the bosses, like, unique abilities sometimes. Like, the, I think the Witch Lord could uh, summon a random monster when he wanted to. Um, against the Ogre Horde actually did bring in uh, Chaos Spells. And then, of course, in the North American version, you did have Chaos Spells for different quests. So these are little tokens. Not tokens. Uh, tiles. You can call them tiles. And these are actually small. They're, like, really small. They fit perfectly on the classic size board but they're actually smaller than the regular tiles, smaller than the regular squares. And certainly they would look tiny on the remake board. But I thought it would be neat because in, uh, let's see which one, Wizards of Morkar, there's a, what's it called? Not Cloak of Shadows. Cloak of Shadows. I always forget if it's the Cloak of Shadows. It's not the Cloud of Chaos. But there's, uh, there's one tile that's this size. But in one of the versions... When you're punching the stuff out, they did it as six tiles. I thought, oh, that's a cool idea. So you could have a version of the spell where you could like break it up and say, okay, well maybe it covers like a you know different pattern of of tiles from just instead of just being one block. So this would be a way to do it. Just print out your own tiles for it. Just little little fun variation. And then on the other side, because I, I made make sure to make them double-sided so you've got images inspired by the marvel winter special revenge of the weatherman so these little images and if you think this art style looks familiar that's i think it's the same artist did these as did the advanced hero quest which i've never played so it's kind of in the same vein of course the marvel winter special was a comic book and so you would have had to cut up the comic book to, to make the tiles. Or I guess, you, you know, you could photocopy them on a paper. But just having a, a thick tile is, is kind of cool. So that's one thing I did. Okay, and you got all these other tiles. So, and I tried to just kind of pattern them, pattern them after the originals. And you're never going to get confused because these are smaller than the originals. So there's a pit of darkness from against the Ogre Horde. There's a ice tunnel or ice pit from uh, Frozen Horror. There's the Ice Key, Frozen Horror. The, this is um, this image is on the uh, GM screen, or the screen in the North American version for Falling Block Trap, but I mean, the Falling Block doesn't look anything like that. I think that looks more like the rubble from the European version, but it's, it's just kind of unique. So I just made a tile of that because I thought it would be a neat kind of alternate decoration. Oh yeah, there's instant ice. This is part of the demagicified world because instant ice is like an invention that the alchemists can use to create little blocks of ice. In the original, it would have been called magic ice. So, but in the demagicified version, it's uh, it's not magic. So, just a minor change because it's just text. This is really easy to do, obviously. Frozen horror. Uh, there you got the werewolf. So this would be like in the elf quest pack when the heroes turn into werewolves. A lot of spoilers. There's a classic falling block trap. So yeah, that does look different than this. But just more decoration. And once a character turns into a werewolf, they would drop their gear. 
So you put this tile down in the ElfQuest pack. Another werewolf. You know, what I should have done is put, uh, or no, I guess, yeah, because you'd have the four piles and then you have the four werewolves if they all turned at once. That's some bad luck right there. More pits of darkness from against the Ogre Horde. There's secret doors, of course. And that. Oh, yeah, there's another pile of stuff. There's a key. This is the key from uh, Elf Quest Pack, Mage of the Mirror. There's a pit. But really, if you're going to make these, a much cheaper way is just to use some chipboard. You can buy chipboard. Some people have used like cereal boxes or those um, pieces of cardboard, like at the end of like a, a notepad, or um, like if you buy a bunch of plastic sheet protectors, there's usually a piece of cardboard at the back. All that stuff works. Just depends on how how thick and durable you want it to be, and just use like a glue stick or some Elmer's glue glue your paper down. Now this is a breached wall tile from Wizards of Morcar. And actually the, I think the four of them, they're slightly different. I just ended up using the same image four times, but whatever. Good enough for me. Good enough for me. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Oh yeah, there's the uh, Elven Prospector from the Elf Quest pack. Here's a completely original one that I came up with. So I just grabbed some images and manipulated them. So there's a torch. I think that might actually be a Skyrim torch, actually. And then I just have the... So it's like the idea is you find a torch and you can set the torch down. And then on the opposite side, I put a mystery square. So you get those situations where you're searching for traps and you're like, uh, uh, um, the floor looks weak. Let me just like put something there so I don't forget. Well, you could use one of these. It's like, oh... I, I bet there's a trap there. So yeah, these these uh, torch tiles. Because I had a whole mechanic for torches. Oh yeah, there's the trap door from uh, is it Return of the Witch Lord that first had these? Oh yeah, there's a fire burst magical trap, fire burst trap from uh, it's blurrier than I thought. Oh well, that looks pretty decent. But yeah, it's from uh, Wizards of Morkar, or Wizards of Zargon, as they call it in Phoenix's translation. There's the Range of the Weatherman again. Oh yeah, um, Flask of Moon Silver. That's from Elf Quest Pack. It's another uh, ice pit or ice tunnel from Frozen Horror. Oh yeah, the ro the infamous Rolling Boulder Trap deal from Keller's Keep. That thing. When I was a kid, I got really mad when that crushed my heroes. But, hey, it's in the rules. I shouldn't be a sore loser. I, I've gotten better since then. <laughs> There's another pile of gear. I like those. You could use it when a hero dies, too. Just throw his gear down. So it either claim, gets claimed by a monster or claimed by a hero. Some more ice pits or ice tunnels. Ice tunnel entrances, I should say. There's another uh, another pack. I noticed they didn't make one for the wizard. Like, you think the wizard one would just be a dagger, a cloak, and a staff. So I actually made one, but I haven't printed it yet. So I'll have to get that done and show it on a future stream at some point. I think we're pretty much getting to the bottom of the pile here as far as tiles. Oh, yeah, the death mist from Return of the Witch Lord. We use that in some of our fan-made quests too, calling it a veil of mistrap or like the spirit of some monster bad guy. There's, what was her name? Uh, the elven princess from Mage of the Mirror. But yeah, whatever her name was. It's been a while since I looked at it. Haven't beaten it, obviously. It's one of the hardest quest books that there is for Hero Quest officially. Barbarian Quest Pack is the hardest, the Frozen Horror. Mage of the Mirror is pretty tough too, though. It's like they were designed to punish people that were good at the other Quest Packs. It's an old video game trope. It's like, oh, you mastered my game. Well, let me just destroy you with the sequel. That's one thing. If, if Hasbro is going to remake the Barbarian Quest Pack, they better be prepared because some people are going to find that so difficult and frustrating that they're going to give up on Hero Quest. 
Uh, that's the reality. Or you'll get, I mean, you'll get people that'll buy it and just be like, this is too hard, but I'm going to use the elements. I'm going to use the cool miniatures and tiles, just to make my own adventure. Thanks very much for the extra assets. But you may get some word of mouth where people are like, this is too hard. So the question is, are they going to revise it? Are they going to make an easy version? Are they going to make, you know, a training wheels version of it? So who knows? But yeah, Elf Quest Pack and Barbarian Quest Pack are just absurd difficulty. There's some fans on Yield End that are working on making uh, Europeanized versions of those because there was never a European version. So giving the monsters like one body point or fewer body points, body point trackers. And um, one suggestion was, well, maybe they should all have like a bunch of big potions they can use between quests or whatever, or not between, uh, during quests. So like a potion that would restore your full body and mind points and you get like five of them, let's say, which is what they did for the European uh, exclusive against the Ogre Horde. Okay, so here's the, uh, these tiles are for, like they're double tiles, but these are like one inch, they're like for one inch square, so two. So these actually fit better on the giant board, but I had an idea of, okay, the portcullis. The problem is it doesn't quite fit very well into the door slot because it's so thick, but you could say, okay, that's like a portcullis there. Here's a double square, and this is how it would have, more how it would have looked in the European version. I like that, it's pretty cool. So Marvel Winter Special type things for like tombs. There's another interpretation of a portcullis or gate. That should look familiar. That is actually very similar to the tombs that are in Return of the Witch Lord, but it's it's a different color. Portcullis there. There's an open tomb. So there's a, another type of tomb. And another type of tomb. But these are actually the marvel winter special versions i believe and not the well no i think these are patterned after the return of the witch lord this is marvel winter special style and i mean i've got the the real one it's just um wanted to make a uh, tile without having to cut anything up and have it be a little more durable this is like a matte finish it's double block north american style and that and we got one of those one of those Here's the other tomb. These are all custom made, of course. These are not official. And that. I think it's cool to be able to just flip it over and say, oh, the grave is open, the grave is closed. That's for your adventures. So a bunch of these double double tiles. Now you, you do get some tiles that you would want to print, but maybe only have like one or two of them and they're a custom size that could run you i mean those would be super expensive if you were just printing out one or two for yourself so for a lot of them you probably just want to cut it out of chipboard yourself with the scissors so that's the way it is and that should be it as far as new stuff actually i do have an unpunched sheet it's not going to be worth anything on eBay, but just keep it for myself, obviously. But uh, there's uh, the mercenary tiles and just a little mercenary coins on the other side. Mercenaries are used in quite a few quests, actually. They're used in Wizards of Morkar. They're used in the Barbarian quest pack. And I guess in theory, you could use them anywhere you wanted. You know, like the heroes can hire some guys to help them out. Hopefully not to be totally cannon fodder, but, you know, some uh, crossbowmen or swordsmen or scouts who can search for and disarm traps or stuff like that. So, yep. So anyway... Thanks for joining us here on HeroQuest Fans. I know it's just kind of a leisurely, kind of casual type video presentation, but I wanted to show you some of that stuff that I've completed and some of the stuff I'm working on, share with you. You know, and it's all a collaborative effort. I mean, I can't claim to have invented any of this stuff, obviously. And even the stuff that's my original idea, you know, it, it was inspired by others, by discussions I had on the forums. You know, I had a great time 
talking with other fans of HeroQuest and Yield In. I don't spend a lot of time on other social media talking about HeroQuest. I think um, back in the day, I, I was on the Prodigy Network, and I think I visited the HeroQuest board just one time because I, I, I vaguely remember a conversation there about, well, what if you had two shields? It's like, well, then you couldn't even fight, but you would have extra defense. You know, some some little conversation like that. That was probably like 95, something like that, 94. Um, but yeah, I kind of forgot about HeroQuest for years until like 2002. And then after that, I got busy. And then it wasn't until maybe like 2016, 2017, got involved again. And the rest was history. So other people do other stuff with their time. But one of my big hobbies... Um, has been working on HeroQuest stuff. But I, I like being able to make new stuff and kind of t- test out my ideas, show it to other people, see what you think, get feedback. And, you know, some of the feedback you're going to say, yeah, that's a great idea. And other stuff, it's like, yeah, you know, you're probably right, but I'm going to go with what I started with. You know, I'm going to do it my way. You know, a little Frank Sinatra there. But uh, what's the point if you can't share it with people, right? So the best thing is to be able to throw it on the gaming table, play it with others, have fun. Put a little variety, a little spice into the game. And who knows, you might inspire other people to uh, create their own stuff and introduce it the next time. So anyway, just want to share that. See you next time in HeroQuest fans. I'm not sure about tomorrow, what we're doing tomorrow. I am doing a Covert Nerds podcast, and whenever he decides to post that up, he will. So we may just end up canceling the stream for tomorrow. Sorry about that. In the past, what I wanted to do is have, you know, today, Friday, be a discussion day, talk about HeroQuest, and then Saturday do a live game or a recording of a recently played game. But we just haven't been able to get people to play live not much recently, which is understandable. I mean, it's the holidays. And for a time there, you know, with uh, COVID, uh, we had a lot of people that were kind of shut in and had nothing to do. And so they were willing to, you know, get online and play. But as restrictions got lifted or people got vaccinated and felt a little more confident, they uh, maybe weren't going to hang around for virtual games. Because really what you want to do is play a live game. That's the best way to play these games. But someday, someday, I mean, this is Twitch. This is uh, the place to play live games. So I definitely want to play some uh, some Hero Quest. Maybe even, even some Battle Masters. I mean, who, who's, who's to say that that's out of the question? So some future stream will probably do something like that. But anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time on Hero Quest Fans. And you can look for these videos soon, uh, if not already on uh, YouTube. Thanks. Everybody stay safe. Take care. And happy holidays.